Hello there. Welcome to the Behemoth time lapse. This project took over five hours of work in ZBrush and it was very similar to my Sentinel project. I recommend you take a look at that time lapse if you haven't already. Like last time, I did not record the parts where I'm rendering and compositing in Keyshot and Photoshop, but we will go through my boat Photoshop file and break it down at the end of the time lapse. Like in my previous video, this time lapse will be split into two segments narrative segments and time lapse segments. The narrative segments is where I talk over the current footage and either discuss something related to the design or also general advice on concepting in ZBrush. The time lapse segments have no narration over it, but I have picked some nice soundtracks to keep you entertained. You can always jump into the YouTube playback settings to adjust the speed of the video if you feel like it either goes too fast or slow. All the segments are timestamped in the description so you can quickly jump between segments that may interest you. I will also put a link to my ArtStation store page where you can download the source file and this video. I hope this video helps you out and as always, if there's anything, you can reach out to me anywhere on social media. Now, let's jump in. All right, all right, all right. Jumping in here, I am starting off with a Tom Newberry base mesh, and uh, I tend to use that one when I am sculpting like this. It just is a very neat one. Yes, and a very nice pose that he's in. If I'm not using that, I'm using the other scan data that I'm starting off. But this is one of my kind of favorites. And I really like this uh, project here. My goal with it was to create more of a like a robot mecha, like something that has exposed parts that um, I, something that I hadn't done before before doing this project, and I think I was successful in a way. Uh, there are some things that I could have done better, like this. Like I intended this robot to be this kind of uh, like the Hulk, to be um, having this massive shield generator that he would be like if he would say on the battlefield he would be able to deploy that to. Uh, cover his allies, but um, I feel like if I would have a second shot with this one, I would definitely add some kind of huge battery that would apply he had the, has this kind of functionality. Um, but this one that I ended up doing is more like just a massive robot. Um, there's one thing that happens a lot uh, when you're working with Dynamesh is that sometimes when you're working with Dynamesh in a really high resolution, it sometimes uh, does this holes thing when you refresh it. So what you want to do is either you go one step back and then you do a close holes operation, which you can find in geometry, modified topology, or you can just do a different kind of Dynamesh resolution. But what I do is that I always just go back one step and then I close holes and then I refresh the dynamics again. And then uh, that should fix uh, the problem that sometimes acquires when you are working with high resolution dynamics work. And I just wanted to point that out to you if this does happen to you uh, when you're working like this.
said, let's talk about using reference while you're doing concepts like these. I use Pureref a ton, which allows you to just drag and drop random images from all over the internet to a nice little handy canvas that you can, you know, throw around these screens if you have multiple. Um, so if you haven't downloaded that already, I definitely recommend you do. I'll put a link to Pureref down in the description. I also use Pinterest or ArtStation to uh, sometimes search for a bunch of images to add to my Pureref files. So basically, I have a master pure F file that has a bunch of cool concepts or artworks that I really find inspirational. They can have cool lighting setups or just some de design language that inspires my personal work and these kind of kind of sketches. I also have other pure F files that just have cars for when I'm working on forms and then some other mechanical stuff or some robotic joints or something to help me design something from scratch, especially when it comes to hard surface. Um,
So, uh, jumping into some kit bashing here, this project had a lot of exposed machinery parts, and I didn't want to take too much time developing all that machinery, as it was supposed to just be a quick concept. But if you are doing, you know, a bigger project, I would definitely recommend you design that from the ground up. This is just, I usually utilize kit bashing when I'm just doing these kind of concepts that I just, that I don't take too much time. And I don't want to take too much time doing those. Like I mentioned in my Sentinel video, I really like to kit bash with Dynamesh turned on. So I mix stuff from other people with my style and character. And if I don't do that, I feel like, um, I feel like some kind of an imposter that is stealing the style from other folks, but you know, that's not true. Uh, it's just something to do with me, but I just feel at ease when I am kit bashing with Dynamesh because then I feel like I am really developing some kind of style that is from myself. But I recommend you try to use Kit Bash with Dynamesh in this way and really blend it in with your design so it doesn't look like you just slapped on random stuff and called it a day. Definitely start by using the Move Brush with back face masking turned on and mix things together with that. That's kind of my first brush that I use when I'm doing those kind of mix ups.
So my general workflow in ZBrush is quite simple actually. I usually jump in when I have a rough idea of what I want to do. Like, what will I do this time? Will I be making a bust, a full-on character, a gun, or a prop, or just some cool rope up with some nice silhouettes? That's kind of my favorite thing to do when I'm just sketching, is just trying to do these kind of cool robotics with some kind of nice silhouette going on. Then I start off with some kind of a base mesh or scan data if I'm making a character, and then I just dynamesh everything, and I go ham with some brushes. I really try to push the design as much as I can with as few subtools before I start to break things apart and masking things off to detail it even further. Uh, the reason I do that is because then each part and brush stroke can influence the design and generate some ha happy accidents within the design process. Then if I'm taking a project further than just a simple sketch, then I mask detail areas off and either extract it with the extract function or just do a split hidden and rip it away from the original subtool. And if I'm doing a bigger project, like a large character or a prop or a weapon, I um, usually add a lot more subtools to it and I refine them a lot more. And that's basically the workflow. I just keep on adding more subtools. It depends on the how detailed whatever you are creating is, but you know, you keep adding subtools and you keep refining it and then you keep adding better forms and maybe applying some function to the, applying some function to the uh, character and then figuring out the backstory from there. And then kind of takes you throughout the whole process. Then from there you can then go into like, for example, Maya and do like a low poly of the character. You can do the UVs in there, then you can take it into Marmoset. You can bake the high poly on the top of the low poly and then you can throw it into Substance Painter and, you know, you can create a game ready character if you really want to take it that far but i usually don't do that with my personal projects but you know every now and then i do Thank you. 
Like I mentioned at the start of the video, I really ended up liking this project. But of course, there were a lot of things that I could have done better, and I learned from doing this project. Like looking on this time lapse now, I feel like I focus way too much on the head of the character, and I should have jumped between the chest and shoulders a lot more actively, instead of focusing on just the head for so long. I was maybe just being too careful when I was designing this uh, behemoth. I also feel like I could have taken some extra time to design some big battery pack or some shield gauntlet for this character, as I intended for this robot to be some kind of a mobile shield that could change the flow of battle. So that's kind of like the lore <laughs> in my head when I was designing this. There's also one thing that I could have maybe done to make it cooler, is I could have made something asymmetrical for a change, but because this character is so symmetrical and such a large beast that it could have benefited from some asymmetry. So I definitely think you should, when you're doing these kind of sketches, you should try to, you know, think about like, how can I maybe make this more asymmetrical in a way? So to generate interest, because symmetrical stuff isn't always the best, even though it looks good. So I think you should definitely keep that in mind. But in the end, this was a fun project and I learned a ton from doing this one. For sure, there were some things that I could have done better, but that's why we do these sketches, right? We do these small projects to improve our workflow, our speed, our like visual library in a way. And so that's why I think it's important to reflect on your past personal project in this way. So you can take something from them and apply it to your next project. So you can get even better at what you're doing.
You can see here now that I'm applying polypaint to the sketch. And I recommend doing this as you go instead of just waiting to do it towards the end because I feel like this is this step is as important as designing the character because it really helps you to evaluate and see the design with different shades of grey or colours or maybe even the lights that you apply to it. So the next time you're doing a sketch like this, I recommend you do this as you're designing it. And I mean, it may sound tedious and it doesn't have to be perfect when you're applying it like that. It's just, it's nice to get that idea, right? There's also one other trick that I recommend playing with and that's the occlusion filter. You can turn that on and off to see the depth of the character or the details that you're creating, like how deep they cut and if you can see them out when you're zooming out of the character. So you can find this under Render, Preview AO and Occlusion. I also recommend tinkering with the default settings in the Occlusion tab because otherwise if you leave it, uh, if you have the settings too heavy then it will impact your performance in ZBrush. So keep that in mind.
Um, there's one thing that I kind of want to talk about when it comes to designing uh, things and sketching like this. These things take time, so don't blame yourself if it takes time. Like, I often find myself getting annoyed just like an hour into a sketching state if, stage if I haven't found a design already. And, you know, if that happens, I just need to remind myself that these things take time and not to be too hard on myself. So if you find yourself in this kind of moment where you are like an hour or two hours in and you feel like your design isn't there yet, then just take a breather, maybe 10 minutes off and then jump back in, look through some references or some kind of inspirational stuff that you really like and grab that and try to use it as fuel to get yourself to your destinations in the design phase because like often we feel like we need to nail that design immediately like two hours into it or you know just just don't be too hard on yourself let yourself explore the design and take your time with it it doesn't have to be done tomorrow it can be done next week or anytime you want so so I just wanted to kind of bring that up. So keep this in mind if you feel that you're stuck and you're just going around in circles and blaming yourself for not nailing something down immediately. It's okay. It's not going to be the end of the world if you give yourself more time on a project and so on. These things take time. And also another design note that I kind of wanted to cover is that if you feel like there's something in the design that you feel like it's worth exploring and that catches your eye, I think you should definitely give yourself a few minutes on on that uh, design thing that you spotted because that could make or break your design, that could help you improve it or, you know, it's nice to be explorative in these kind of early sketching stages and it's just more fun to be loose with it instead of being very rigid and just going like, okay, I need to make it like this and this and not exploring other ideas that may pop up, you know, those happy accidents, eh?
So now, as we are nearing the end of the time lapse, I wanted to cover some key shot stuff or something related to the key shot rendering stage, because I don't want to really record that part um, as part of this time lapse videos. And I wanted to highlight some other resources that I have helped me out when I'm doing these kind of projects. So if you're looking to create your own custom key shot materials, I recommend you searching for Espen Oxhall on YouTube. His videos have really helped me improve my material work and lighting setup in Keyshot. And, and also, if you feel like the HDRIs inside of Keyshot are not doing its job, I recommend starting off with just a completely dark HDRI. It comes up, it comes with uh, a Keyshot. So using that one and then doing a three-point lighting setup, so you do your own lighting from there, from scratch. I think that's a good idea maybe to practice. And, Either if you feel like you want other HDRIs that um, are not in Keyshot, you can jump over to Polyhaven. They have a ton of free HDRIs that you can download and use for your scenes. And if you're also looking for background images to go along with your scenes, I have been using Unsplash for a long time. Also, they have like really high quality free images there, and you can use that as well for your scenes. I'll put a link to all these sites in the description, so you can find them there. Now we're going to take some time to break down my Photoshop file and see how I wrap up my projects. 
First of all, when I am starting in Keyshot, I usually apply a custom material or some kind of colors, some metal material to the whole character, and then I'm masking it out in Photoshop. And what I also do is I get some background that maybe complement the character in some way. And before I insert it into the um, key shot, I usually blur it in Photoshop and then I put it in. And the reason for that is because I feel like with the filters that I apply, bloom and chromatic aberration inside of key shot, I feel like it mixes with the character and the background a lot more than doing it afterwards. And what I also do is I have emissive turned on for the, all of the layers because I'm not going to be tinkering with that. So I have, for this one, I've exported five colors in total uh, and materials. So I have a black material that doesn't have any roughness associated with it. And you can see how I masked it out here. And I have a black damaged one with roughness. And I have a gray, a light gray one. And I have a dark metal one. And then what I always do is I export an ambient occlusion pass as well. And I usually, it depends on the project, but I have it I set at 80% opacity at this time. It just, you can see here, if I turn it on and off, you can see it just, it creates a lot more depth to the character and a lot more saturation to it, I suppose. You can see here, now when I'm done with the key shot passes, is that I merge everything together. That's basically my whole workflow. It's kind of like a checkpoint system in a way. I merge everything before, and then I add new things to that. So for example, in this one, I added a camera raw filter to enhance some of the visuals, and I do it multiple times throughout the project. It's kind of always tinkering things in subtle ways until you get your desired effect, or you find something on the way that you feel like is a cooler, look for the character. So you can see here with this camera or filter, I have the opacity set to 23. And the reason for that is because I felt like at the time at least, uh, this camera or filter that I applied was maybe too intense in some areas. So instead of going back into the camera or filter and tinkering with things, I just changed the opacity. And that's where these kind of merging or this kind of checkpoint system comes into play because it's a lot easier to just do those kind of things and then move on instead of going back to the camera or filter. And then I do a merge again, and I do a color lookup table. And these are from, the ones that I use are from Grayscale Gorilla. And you can get those in the link, link in the description. But I use them on basically all of my projects just to enhance the visuals. And I usually have them, mix them together a little bit more, usually towards the end of my projects. And the opacity is always a little bit less than 100%. And then I merge it again. And then I have this section here where I'm, I always do the markings before I do a roughness and scratch pass. So I don't do scratches and I have to do decals and then I have to scratch it again. So the markings are usually from myself, Mike Nash, and then I have a few from J.R.O., like some kind of decals. And like these kind of markings are just made in Photoshop. It's really simple ones. And the power here is to combine them in a way that it makes it look coherent for the character. Yeah, so you can see here, uh, I have different blending modes and I usually have, add a blur to them as well. So, because sometimes the text is too sharp and it just looks out of place for the character. You can also do this in key shots, but I just find it a lot better to do it afterwards for some reason. And then I merge everything together again with the uh, now markings attached to it. And now we go into the scratching and the roughness kind of part of it. You can see uh, a lot of changes between these kind of sections. I had a bunch of like, there's some kind of oil filter here. There's a lot of, a lot of roughness spots, uh, scratches and stuff. I feel like maybe I scratched this guy up too much, but in my head, I was thinking like, this is some kind of battle robot. He's, you know, he's seen a lot of combat during his day, days of service. And you can see here, I usually copy my metal pass that I have exported out. Uh, it's over here. I, I copy this dark metal one and I basically just add it again on top of everything and then I mask uh, with a fine brush and I just zoom in and I try to be like, okay, this seems like an area that makes sense that I should have scratched up. And it's just nice to go again. So you have the automatic part with the materials set up in some of key shot and then we combine it with a manual one from the one you do in Photoshop. I think that's the powerful thing about this. So now I'll merge everything again. So I ended up not liking the background I picked for the character, but I didn't want to go back. So I just decided to uh, uh, fight it out and I blurred the background a little bit more. And um, 
So I just try to work with it more. But I feel like if I were to do this a project again, I would try to find a more complementary background for the character and with one which is not too light. Like this one is so very light, so I feel like it takes away attention from the character. And what I did here is I wanted to direct the light from here, so it's going to the face, um, just with a gradient. And then I merge everything again. And my trick always is to so darken areas that you don't want the eye to look, and then you lighten up the areas that you want the eye to be in. But like again, uh, what I was talking about earlier with the background is the background ended up being too bright here. So I think that's a mistake. But I mean, it's okay. You just learn from those mistakes and you remember, remember that for the next project. And then I merge again. I do an iris blur filter. So the camera raw filter, you can find it over here. And then you go to blur gallery and that's the iris blur. It's basically just a circular blur. And you can see here, it kind of blurs out the edges, edges of the, you know, where you want the uh, blur to focus. And then I merge everything again and do a vignette. And then what I do usually, I have two sections of camera raw filter that I do final. And in the camera raw filter, you can find a bunch of settings, uh, exposure, contrast, highlights, vibrance, saturation, temperature. You can play with a bunch of settings to figure out what you want to do for your concept and or character or prop or whatever. So it's a really powerful tool when you're just developing like this. But you can see the difference. Um, so I usually do a very intense camera raw filter pass in the end uh, after doing a lot of those subtle ones. And then I fixed the, it's a really subtle one, but you can see the uh, kind of the eye of the character or the robot that I um, fixed a little bit more because I felt like it was not, it could be more intense, it could be more intense. So then again with the grayscale gorilla lookup tables, I have enabled them. So you can see here the difference with and without them. I think it's just nice to go through them and just figure out, okay, so I want this style and this really complements it. And I never really have them at 100% of opacity. So you can see 35% and 50. And then towards the end, I wrap everything up by adding a film grain and a lens correction pass, which is you can find over here. So that's about it for this breakdown. You can see here on screen now, the before and after, and you can see how powerful it is to know these kind of things when you're doing these kind of concept pieces. I mean, you don't want to do this for all of your projects, but when you're doing those quick sketches every now and then, it's nice to take them all the way. It doesn't take that much extra time, and it's just fun to explore your character a little bit more. Thank you so much for watching this time-lapse with me. You can also check out my other time-lapse video on my Sentinel project and my Hard Surface Tips and Tricks videos if you haven't already. If you enjoyed the video, then definitely consider subscribing for there will be more content in the near future. Alright, that's it. Until next time everyone.